Okay, folks, I think it's 4 o'clock. Uh, time for us to get started. Welcome to the uh, July 2018 meeting of the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District. Uh, before we get rolling, uh, Mr. Burke, would you go ahead and read the uh, safety briefing? Sure. We're currently in the uh, auditorium uh, in Energy Plaza on the uh, east side of the building here. So obviously most of you came in one of the exits. There are also two other exits on this side here. Uh, in the event of an emergency or a fire, we would take these uh, exits and we would exit out on the 16th Street side of the building down the steps. Make sure as you go down the steps you use your three-point touch, one hand on the railing, two feet on the ground. Um, in the event of a uh, storm, uh, we would um, actually, uh, security would kind of uh, separate the group and one would move to the west side of the building uh, into the garage area and others would move to our call center area as well. The fire extinguisher uh, is right around the corner, um, right around just outside this door and around the corner. Uh, the AED and the first aid kit are one on top of each other. If you were going to go into the cafeteria, okay. it's on the right hand side on the brick ball, one on top of each other. Um, and is anybody here certified in the use of an AED or in CPR? So we have some uh, in, uh, in play here. And I believe we have members of our security that would call 911 in the event that we need it. Um, so thank you very much. If you have a medical condition, uh, please write it down or tell your neighbor. I believe that concludes the safety briefing. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, let's run through uh, our list of uh, some housekeeping items before we get going. First and foremost, please silence your electronic devices. Uh, this regular board meeting will follow the agenda made available to the public upon entering the meeting today. This meeting is streaming live on the internet at OPPD.com. Our regular board meetings have public comment periods on the agenda. Following board discussion on each pending matter, I will ask for public comment before bringing the matter to a vote. Also, prior to adjournment of the meeting, you'll have an opportunity to comment on any other uh, OPPD matters. If you wish to speak, please approach the microphone to your far left and state your name and address and state the name of any organization or person you may be representing. Organizations should choose one representative to speak on their behalf so as to avoid repetitive commentary. Comments made by all parties during the meeting are a part of the official public record. Each individual will be allotted at three <coughs> minutes per matter pending at the discretion of the board. To assist you, we use a red, yellow, green light indicator to ensure each member of the public receives a consistent amount of time. Ms. Tracy will signal you when 30 seconds remain, as well as when time is up. Please direct your comments to me, not to other board members or the executive team. I'll either respond to you directly or defer response to another board member or most likely an officer of the, of the district. If you brought written materials, Ms. Tracy will receive those items on, on uh, our behalf. Ms. Tracy, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Here. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Moody? Here. Trinan? Yes. Yoder? Here. Agenda item number four, notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media by publicizing same in the Omaha World Herald and outlets. By displaying such notice on the RK level of Energy Plaza since July 3rd, 2018 and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this <coughs> meeting room. Now on to the board consent action items as follows. Agenda item number five. Approval of the May 2018 Comprehensive Financial and Operating Reports, June 7, 2018 Board Meeting Minutes, and the July 12, 2018 Agenda. Number six, Financial Auditing Services, Resolution Number 6257. Number seven, Fort Calhoun Independent Spent Fuel Installation, Resolution Number 6258. Number eight, Nebraska City Unit 2. Spare Circulation Water Pump Materials, Resolution Number 6259, Number 9, SD9 Re Resource Planning Monitoring Report, Resolution Number 6260, and Number 10, Annual Health Plan Report, Resolution Number 6261. Are there any corrections, changes, or additions to these items at, these time, at this time? If not, I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do any directors care to comment on any of these consent items? five through ten sure I just want to clarify for those of you who aren't able to attend the meeting on Tuesday that the SD 9 monitoring report is just to confirm the status of what has happened and um, there is interest in making some changes as yet we don't know what those are okay. any other directors comments on these particular items 
Seeing none, does any members of the public care to comment on these consent items? David Corbin, 1002 North 49th Street. I want to remind you that uh, I represent the Nebraska Sierra Club, so we have over 2,000 members in the OPPD area. So when I speak, it's not just me. I wanted to respond to SD9 because I, uh, I just want to point out the fact of the interaction between the SDs. So uh, when you're talking about environmental regulation, that has to do with uh, resource planning as well. And so oftentimes I see the, what I think is the false dichotomy of economic versus uh, environmental, and they are not mutually exclusive. You can do something good for the environment that's also good for uh, the economy and for uh, how you plan your resources. Uh, Tuesday, you were talking about decommissioning and you were looking 20, 40, 60 years into the future. I wish you would have long-term goals on some other areas and that instead of, for example, for solar, talking about two years, wait and see what happens. You talked a little bit about wellness and since that's my area, I want to make a, an analogy between uh, wellness. Uh, you don't have wellness programs to save money. That's one reason. You do wellness programs because it's the right thing to do and it's because of the humanitarian thing to do. So when I see on the chart that says for resource planning, environmental regulations, that to me says, you don't worry about the environment unless somebody makes you do something. And I think that's a wrong way to look. We are public power, you are protecting the public, and I hope that you will take that into mind when you look at this and the environmental one next. Also want to point out what's <coughs> common in my field of public health and health education, what's called the fusion of innovation. They, they talked about solar and the DER plan, and they said, well, not many people want to do it. And they said the main thing they, want, want, they look at is economic issues. Well, that's partly your fault. You, don't, you keep telling us solar is not affordable. You don't do anything to help to do that. If you looked at the early adoption of phones, you would see that there's always early adopters. I would maintain that's the Sierra Club. I'd say at least 80 to 100 of electric vehicles are owned by members of the Sierra Club and people that are buying the, and your program are also Sierra Club. I would hope that you would reach out to those early innovators and then help to make sure that that diffusion of inter, uh, uh, innovation, the first step is knowledge. 30 seconds. And you have to give this, the amount of information to the public who you serve so Instead of just saying solar's too expensive, that's not the thing to do. So people have to know what's possible. We know what's possible by looking at other areas. I salute you on going through all of these. I just hope that you make them a little bit more comprehensive and refer one SD to the others. Thank you. Okay, seeing uh, no other comments, uh, Kim, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Moody? Yes. Trinan? Yes. Yoder? Yes. Motion carried. Agenda item number 11. Oh, I'm out of order here. One second. Motion to dispense with the reading of resolution number 6255, series resolution for electric system revenue bonds 2018 or 2019 series. Be it resolved that because of a copy of resolution number 6255 has been furnished to each director in advance of this meeting, the reading in full of the resolution in this meeting by the secretary be dispensed with except for those portions of the resolution which have been materially revised and the additions necessary to complete said resolution. Okay, we need a motion and a second to dispense with the reading of this so lengthy. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Does that, do any directors care to comment on the resolution to defer the reading? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I said this on Tuesday. I want to repeat it today. I want to commend Vice President, Chief Financial Officer Javier Fernandez and his team, including John Thurber, Laura Langford. I don't, sorry, I don't know the rest of the team who's on it. This is the second example of excellent treasury management in the last eight months. This saves millions of dollars for the ratepayers in our district, and I just think it's a great, it's a great job. So thank you very much. 
Do, is there any members of the public who wish to comment on the dispensing of the reading of this resolution? Seeing none, um, can we please call the roll? Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? <clears throat> yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Moody? Yes. Trinan? Yes. Yoder? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, I'd like to call on Mr. John Petter to come up and uh, address the uh, our, our, our bond council to address the changes to resolution 6255. John? You Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, as, uh, as you noted, I'm John Petter with the firm of QT Brock, <coughs> bond council to the district. Uh, and I can confirm based on my discussions with district management that there have been no changes to the text of resolution 6255. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 6255 authorizes the creation and issuance of the electric system revenue bonds 2018 or 2019 series. Okay, we need a motion and a second to approve the resolution. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, comments? Uh, Mick? Do you have to... I get to read this? Yes. <laughs> unfortunately, we have to read this into the record. And I'm, unfortunately, it's, only it's not very long. It's unfortunately, not, I'm the one that's reading pages. it to you. Uh, management believes that it's, it is in the best interest of the district to have the ability to act promptly, given favorable market conditions, to issue new debt, to replenish liquidity by reimbursing previously incurred capital expenditures, or by funding anticipated capital expenditures and related transaction costs. Management may, it may, management may issue one or more new series bonds not to exceed $200 million to be known as the 2018 or 2019 series electric system revenue bonds with such additional letter designations as deemed appropriate at the time of issuance. The bonds will be traditional tax-exempt bonds. One more paragraph. The board of directors will receive quarterly updates on the status of authorized bonds. Final, final pricing of a series authorized bonds will be presented at the next regularly scheduled board meeting immediately following the execution of the bond purchase agreement. Thank you very much. Um, I'll call on Mr. Petter again. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I can confirm on behalf of QTAP Brock that upon issuance of the district's bonds in accordance with resolution 6255, uh, QTAC Rock expects to be in a position to issue its opinion as to the validity, enforceability, and tax exempt status of OPPD's bonds. Are there any questions? Mr. Petty. No? Thank, Thank you. you. Now I'll call Mr. Bruckner, our general counsel. Thank you, Chairman Kavanaugh, members of the board. Uh, as general counsel, we've examined the proposed series bond res resolution, which is resolution number 6255, before the board at this time. Uh, with respect to the issuance of the electric system revenue bonds 2018 or 2019 series, it is our opinion that the series resolution is appropriate uh, and that it, is, that it is legally proper for the Board of Directors to authorize the resolution uh, which would authorize the issuance of those bonds in an aggregate amount that would not exceed $200 million. And the authorization, as indicated in the resolution, would terminate uh, no later than December 31 of 2019. Are there any questions? I will present a written version of the opinion to Ms. Tracy. Thank you. Okay. Any comments before we uh, we vote? Okay, seeing none, any members of the public wish to comment at this time? Seeing no one, um, <coughs> Kim, will you go ahead and call the uh, call the vote? Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Moody? Yes. Trinan? Yes. Yoder? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, our next item is item number 13, and it's the it's President Burke's uh, monthly report. No, we have no report. No, 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 Sales resolution for electric system revenue bonds 2018 or 2019 series. Be it resolved that because of a copy of resolution number 6256 and the preliminary official statement incident to the 2018 or 2019 series bonds have been furnished to each director in advance of this meeting, the reading in full of the resolution and the preliminary official statement in this meeting by the secretary be dispensed with except for those portions of the resolution and preliminary official statement which have been materially revised and the additions necessary to complete said resolution and the preliminary official statement. 
I'm sorry. Do we have a motion and a second? So moved. We have a motion. We need a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, any board comments before we uh, vote on this? The dispense with me. Seeing none, any members of the public wish to comment on this dispensing of the reading of this resolution? Seeing none, uh, Kim, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Moody? Yes. Trinan? Yes. Yoder? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, uh, I'm going to call on Mr. Petter again, to our bond counsel. To Thank you again. At the risk of wearing out my welcome, uh, I can uh, <laughs> confirm to you that there have been uh, no changes to the text of uh, resolution number 6256 or the preliminary official statement relative to the versions you received. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution number 6256 approves the official statement and provides authority for the president and chief executive officer or the vice president and chief financial officer to execute one or more investment banking agreements, pricing certificates, and bond purchase agreements for the 2018 or 2019 series bonds through December 31st, 2019. As such date may be extended by further action of the board. This authority would allow the bonds to be sold when acceptable market conditions exist, regardless of the timing of regularly scheduled board meetings. Do you need a motion and a second? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, Mick. Uh, resolution number 6256 approves the official statement and provides authority for the president and chief executive officer or the vice president and chief financial officer to execute investment banking agreements, pricing certificates, and bond purchase agreements for the 2018 or 2019 series bonds through December 31st, 2019, as such date may be extended by further action of the board. This authority would allow the bonds to be sold and when acceptable market conditions exist regarding the timing or regular scheduled board meetings. The district's financial advisor, Barclays Capital, has, Inc. Barclays Capital Inc. has in indicated that if the district's liquidity resources are depleted, issuing new debt to reimburse or to fund capital purposes is a reasonable strategy to capitalize on market interest rates. Pursuant to resolution number 6256, a written opinion of the district's financial advisor will certify to the board that the terms of the 2018 or 2019 series bonds <coughs> reflect rates competitive with current market conditions. Final pricing of any 2008 or 2019, 2018 or 2019 series bonds Issues will be presented at the regular scheduled <coughs> board meeting immediately following the execution of the bond purchase agreement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brucker. Thank you again, Chairman Kavanaugh, members of the board. Uh, we are pleased to present our opinion uh, with respect to resolution number 656, 6256, excuse me. Resolution 6256 authorizes the President and Chief Executive Officer of the District or the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer to execute and deliver one or more pricing certificates, bond purchase agreements, and official statements for the 2018 or 2019 series bonds through and including December 31, 2019. And it is our opinion that the resolution is in a proper and legal form that is appropriate for passage by the Board of Directors. Unless there are any questions, I'll present the written opinion to Ms. Tracy. I have one question. Sure. Um, we're utilizing our cash on hand to facilitate this bond thing. Can you discuss that a little bit? As you know, I know previously we've done it many, many years ago, but this is the first time we've done it in quite a while. If you could uh, explain that, or maybe with I, the help of uh, Mr. I certainly can, but I think it might be yeah. best for Mr. Fernandez to do that. Yeah, maybe if you Thank could you. do that, it would be great. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Yeah. It's an opportunity. It's, it's a great idea. Is what I well, think. and the question provides me with an opportunity to to discuss the financial condition of the district, which is a, a you know in a pretty solid uh, condition. The district, through the fiscal discipline, has been building on its financial strength, uh, and one of one of the many ways we have to measure that is through our liquidity and reserves. And I'm happy to present here to the board, and it's something that I presented uh, about a year ago, that our cash and liquidity position is favorable. Uh, favorable enough that we have the position today to use existing cash to pay off high interest rate debt that we have on our books today. This is a, a transaction that is uh, fiscally prudent. It will continue to help us lower our interest rate exposure and overall interest cost for all of our rate payers. 
separately but somewhat related, um, we have an opportunity then to look at our liquidity position after the cash defeasance. And if, if we have an opportunity to replenish cash into the district by issuing debt, uh, new money, new debt to finance new uh, capital that has been incurred this year at lower interest rates, we would do so. And this is the, the, the resolution that you've all uh, approved or you're in the middle of, of, of approving. Uh, these would help us replenish liquidity into the district and the overall result would be we would end up with lower interest costs and, and, and a lower interest expense for all of our customer owners without necessarily losing any position or liquidity. So this, this is, a, a, from my opinion, a, a fiscally responsible uh, transaction that capitalizes on the district's financial position. We would not be able to to do this for, for our customer owners if we did not have the, the liquidity position we have today. <coughs> Thank I you. hope that I just it, yeah I just think that gives everybody the, the whole picture of it of what we're doing which is great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kim. Barrett. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Gay. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Moody. Yes. Trident. Yes. Yoder. Yes. Motion carried. Okay, now it's time. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman Kevin. I appreciate that. I'm going to move right into uh, the presentation today. We talk a little bit about our generation, both our base load and our renewable generation to date. In Nebraska City uh, 1 and Nebraska City 2, units uh, 4 and 5 at North Omaha, you can see the capacity factors there. Most of them um, are have been available for full load uh, in the month of June. Obviously, some minor D rates as we do some maintenance and some uh, other work uh, through the course of the, of the hot weather, but uh, high capacity factors uh, in that regard, primarily because of the uh, market conditions and also because of uh, the warm weather uh, that we have had. Units 1, 2, and 3 at North Omaha are available on natural gas and um, <clears throat> and will uh, have the capability to use them in the event that we need them. I will talk about two other items real quick before I go to the next one. Sorry about that. Sure. I added something on you, Kim. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Ms. Fisher talked a little bit about um, a filing that we're going to be doing uh, with uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, concerning releasing um, or looking at a partial site release of about 120 acres uh, on the north edge of the Fort Calhoun property. Uh, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk about that in this, that we are looking at uh, releasing that property. We went through the filing. We'll be submitting that to the NRC. It'll take about um, a, a year for that filing uh, to be approved by the NRC for us to release that property for um, other development or economic development opportunities uh, to look at um, a greater use of, of that property, and we'll continue that. Uh, also reported on Thursday, and I think it'd be a good, great opportunity just to, to remind people the status of our dry cast storage uh, project. It remains on schedule, and the primary on-site work is focused on the construction of the concrete cast storage modules. Uh, and out of the total of 30 of each of these components, uh, we've safely completed nine bases 14 roofs and 12 doors to date on those uh, facilities. And we're going to continue that work again on schedule uh, and on budget as we had planned. On the renewable side, uh, renewable energy in the month of June contributed to 28.6% of OPPD's retail sales uh, with a wind capacity factor of 42.9%. Uh, year to date, uh, renewable energy has contributed to 33.8% of our retail sales with a capacity factor uh, near uh, 50%. Um, obviously, as we, we have seen during these hot summer months, we're going to see that drop down a little bit, but then pick back up in the shoulder months as well. And in a couple weeks, um, we didn't talk about this on Tuesday, but in a couple weeks, we'll be doing um, our um, kind of ribbon cutting, groundbreaking for the new Shoals uh, wind project up near Wayne, Nebraska. It's about 160 megawatts, and we're looking forward to that. And, and we'll certainly have a good uh, OPPD contingent up there supporting that um, as well. <clears throat> thought I would share uh, this. I ended up having the opportunity to uh, to speak at a Rotary meeting um, yesterday, and and also the the board has uh, seen this information and in other communication. But this is just a great example of what OPPD is trying to do as we begin to look at our Cool Smart and our Nest curtailment um, programs and services that we offer. 
So really quick, uh, if you take a look at that orange line on the top or that brown line on the top, um, that would have been the typical kind of load pattern that we would have seen without any curtailments that we would have um, or the cycling of air conditioners or uh, implementing our nest curtailment uh, program uh, uh, this year. And this was a specific date. I believe this was like June 15th. Um, and so you can see the significant change between what really happened, which was the yellow uh, line there. We saw about a 50 uh, plus megawatt uh, reduction uh, in just operating our um, AC management program, our Cool Smart program, uh, which cycles uh, air conditioners. Um, I think that's, that's pretty important for us to do. We have 43,000 customers uh, on that program. And then there's a, a finer line below that. It's a, it's a blue line, but you see a reduction between the yellow and the blue. And that's the implementation of our Nest uh, thermostat program, uh, where we make adjustments uh, in that thermostat based on the, uh, the, the program that we have partnered with Nest. And so you can see another, uh, I believe it was um, two plus megawatts uh, of reduction on the 2,300 customers. Um, the reason why that's important is that we base our capacity needs based on our peak load. And we have to have 12% uh, capacity capability above our peak load uh, in any given year. And so um, this is one of the examples that we've used uh, primarily in our residential uh, customers now on the value and the benefit of Cool Smart uh, in our nest uh, curtailment events. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to share that a little bit uh, in this forum uh, today. So thank you for allowing me to do that. We have a couple Honor Our Community events uh, that have gone on um, just in this past month. Over 80 employees um, participated in about 400 volunteer hours uh, on our Day of Giving. Uh, this is in conjunction with the American Public Power Association's Day of Giving, and this occurred on June 15th as well. Uh, OPPD employees volunteered at the Food Bank of the Heartland, Heartland Hope Mission, the Cross Training Center, the Stevens Center, the Stevens Center Thrift Store, um, and our uh, specifically our Fort Calhoun employees uh, from the 15th through the 21st actually collected non-perishable items uh, for the Joseph's Coat um, uh, facility and organization uh, in the Blair area as well. And so it's just a great opportunity for us giving back and representing uh, the value of public power and, and the work that we do. Um, honor our community, uh, several months ago we were um, contacted by an organization, uh, Save Our Monarchs, Monarchs Foundation, um, about uh, is there a way for us to assist uh, in some of the work uh, that they have going on. Um, and so over a course of time, uh, about 970 million monarchs have vanished since 1990 for a variety of reasons. Increased farmland use, pesticide use, a variety of, a variety of reasons. Um, and so we went ahead and, and partnered because of the critical migration path of the monarchs uh, from from Canada to um, from North America to to Mexico, um, they have also identified that the loss of milkweed, uh, which from an old farm guy we used to you know uh, take out of the bean fields, right? But it was very important for the migration of the monarchs, and so um, OPPD uh, over a, a couple times over the last couple of months uh, have uh, vo had volunteers, our employees, along with the uh, Save Our Monarch Foundation. Um, essentially plant plugs and do a variety of different seeding uh, for uh, the increase of milkweed in some of our green space and some of our prairie uh, lands that we have up at Fort Calhoun, uh, the OPPD Arboretum. Um, and so we're using that to, to really benefit the, the environment and to create uh, value and benefit. Um, and so from an old Iowa farm kid who used to take monarchs and put needles in styrofoam through them, uh, I don't do that anymore. Sorry about that. I didn't uh, realize I might have been part of that. Uh, but not since 1990 have I done that. That was probably in the early 60s, something like that. But anyway, it's a great opportunity on, on our commitment and giving back to the community. And then on June 21st, we actually uh, partnered uh, along with United Way in their day of giving uh, and really reinforced the value of reading uh, through a variety of different students um, across uh, our service territory. Uh, it's a two-hour effort that addresses the issues of summer learning loss uh, and kickstarts a summer reading program that encourages students to begin reading to prepare for next year. And it's just a great opportunity of how our employees are giving back to the community. <clears throat> 
And as we do each year, we talk uh, a little bit about safety and about uh, how the uh, men or women at OPPD have given their life uh, in the event of the service that we provide. And so uh, this individual, Arthur uh, Packheiser, uh, was a lineman who died on February 25th, 1948 from injuries sustained in a 35-foot fall when the pole he and a co-worker were on broke off near the base. The co-worker, Bert Christensen, was hospitalized with several fractures. They were working in Herman, Nebraska at the time. He was 49 years old at the time of his death, and he was survived by his wife, Velma, daughters Constant, and Laura Jean, uh, and, his two, and his son, uh, Raymond, as well. And it's just a great uh, reminder for us that safety is incredible, uh, uh, incredibly important to us, our employees, and our customers uh, as well. And with that, that concludes my uh, president's report. Thank you. Now's the time, it's the opportunity for uh, folks that are here uh, who would care to comment on any other items of district business that uh, we haven't touched on already. Is there anyone here that cares to speak? Hi, Mike. Oh. You're fine. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ali. I'm 8504 Douglas Street. Um, I have an electric car parked right outside, uh, Chevy Bolt. There's no charging station. You know, West Star in Kansas, every West Star office has a charging station. I, I was in Kansas City Saturday at IKEA uh, and charging next door at BMW Level 2 Charger. And then on, on my way back, I stopped at okay. on 29 at exit 50 speedy fast charger. Uh, uh, I charged up to 80%. I had to be back here. And I got here. You know, I've been to Pittsburgh, Kansas, like six times in my electric car round trip. Um, uh, around Kansas and along 29 and 69, there's a whole bunch of fast chargers. So, uh, uh, and all around Kansas City, there's a million chargers. So you guys need to put a lot of charges all over the city as well, and especially fast chargers, DC fast chargers, because if you have a level two charger at home, um, then you, you know just adding a mile or two while you're at a store is meaningless. So you really need fast chargers. And um, another thing I wanted to comment on is that I have two Nest thermostats. So at night, besides that management that you do delaying, at night, whenever wind is blowing and you have a lot of cheap energy, you can uh, lower that thermostat and, and store energy by cooling the house, super cooling the house, like a few degrees lower than it's set. And that, that way you can store some of the energy, then you don't have to cool it during the day as much. Uh, uh, so if you, if you uh, gave me the ability or gave me an incentive, th that would be a nice thing. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is if I install a Tesla Powerwall or BYD uh, backup battery system, then I can level my demand and don't send any peaks to you and just send you a level demand. So that is worth a lot of money to you, so you guys should incentivize me to get a Tesla Powerwall and give you you know, uh, uh, a level demand rather than uh, without any peaks. Uh, and then I wanted you guys to take a look at that solar light. That's a 1,000 lumen solar light that Walmart sells for $28. It, it comes on at 100 lumen and it goes up to 1,000 whenever somebody's close by. So if Walmart can sell that for 28 bucks seconds. in their regular products, then for maybe $280, uh, it tells me that every outside light, every street light is going to be w wireless, just like the landline thing didn't happen in all over the third world. Uh, l wired lights are not going to happen, and eventually they'll come back to first world, and no outside light is going to be powered by wires. So you need to prepare for that future and start getting on board with it. Time. Thank you. Ali, Ali, I have a couple questions for you. Yes. Um, what What is the need for two two thermostats? You mentioned you had two thermostats. I have a big house, so I have. Oh, okay. A, a, two furnaces, so two ACs, so okay. I have two thermostats. Okay. And how about what's the cost of doing one of those fast chargers? 
Do you? I, I don't know the cost, okay. but I, I just I bought was, the It's just because I'm curious. I'm not trying to say. So I know, just bought a fast, uh, you know, when this, these electric cars first came out, the fast the charges, even the slow charges, the level two ones used to cost like 10000 I just bought one through your system, 500 and something dollars from Amazon. Um, I still have to figure out how to do the rebate, but, uh, um, you know, so my yeah, charger has a Wi-Fi system and it's connected to you. So I have uh, this, you know, Chevy Bolt with a huge battery, which could be used as a backup battery. And if it's plugged in, you can use some of that power in your peak times in the morning and in the <coughs> afternoon. And you can incentivize me and uh, in some way to keep it plugged in during those times. And, you know, at night, I usually charge it at night, so it's fully charged up at night from your chief wind energy and um, uh, uh, you can use it during the daytime and give me something in return and for it and you don't have to do any additional capacity. And you purchased that through OPPD or a rebate? Yes, yeah, I did through, through that rebate. Amazon okay. OPPD right. deal. But I haven't figured out how to do all the paperwork yet, which if somebody <laughs> here knows how to do it, it would be great. So, I already got mine. <laughs> so the district is actually doing something. We're just not walking around like some Neanderthals. We're trying to do something. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we, if you do 23 and me, you know you have a little bit Neanderthal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, my knuckles are hairy. So you are uh, walking around in Neanderthal. And, and how, no. about, how about the Walmart light was the last question. Have you sampled that? Have you plugged it? Or you? I have plugged it in. They, you can also buy a 2,000 lumen security light for $35. Okay. Is and it I, have, I have actually installed four of those in, in different nonprofits and one in my house. Okay. Because, you know, there's a big difference between solar solar lamps that I have in my garden no, and this one is no, lamps that this I have. This one is not your dad's, uh, your grandfather's solar light. Okay. This one is tomorrow's solar light, which is 1,000 lumen, 20-year warranty on the LED and the solar panel, five-year warranty on the battery. It's a lithium-ion okay. battery. So I may be going to Wally's. All right. <laughs> you should. Wally, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. China, though, we might be in trouble. It might oh, be yes. more expensive. <coughs> okay, seeing no other uh, we, we have we a one one over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Here we go. Look. George Cheka, the last name is spelled C E J K A. <coughs> I'm a longtime OPPD customer. Each month when I open my bill, I read the newsletter and see the notice for this meeting, and several times I thought, I need to go down just to see what happens. <laughs> But this time I have I came to, with a question and probably don't really expect an answer at this point, but I hope you all are still work it, really working on it. Are OPPD resources hardened for EMP? Yeah, I think uh, I'll go ahead and take a quick answer of that. I, there's uh, very limited, uh, the question is, is OPPD's resources uh, protected from electromagnetic uh, pulse? pulse? And, and the answer is um, they are not. There's, there's um, I don't think there is any technology to date that allows that to occur on distribution systems. There's a variety of research that's going on around that and a variety of different protections around that. I'm not sure if, Mary, you want to talk a little bit about generation, but um, it, it really is not. Um, it's really the prevention side of that EMP issue or concern uh, that we work with, either with the Department of Homeland Security from a terroristic uh, perspective, uh, but from a national perspective, we uh, work obviously with the uh, utility industries um, and a variety of uh, other agencies, such as the Department of Energy, on that. Thank you. Thank you. Good question, John. Great question, John Pollock, fourteen twelve North Thirty Fifth Street, Omaha. Uh, weather first. Uh, we've got a. Uh, large heat dome over the uh, middle of the country right now. However, uh, the uh, medium to longer range weather models are pretty consistent with uh, moving that heat dome into the western U.S. Uh, that puts us back in the so-called ring of fire I was talking about last month. The other factor is that uh, unlike sometimes this early in July, uh, the heat dome is pretty well saturated with, uh, to an unusual degree, with monsoon moisture, that, which is uh, picked up out, out of the Pacific Ocean as 
well as the Gulf of Mexico in this case. So uh, what this means is that uh, we're going to be having a more active uh, weather pattern later in July than uh, early July. Uh, uh, northwest flow aloft means that we'll be having uh, occasional uh, fronts quite hot ahead of the front, uh, below normal weather behind the front. So we're probably going to be averaging near to below normal for uh, the latter part of July. However, we're going to have a few hot days that are ahead of the fronts, like today is a good example. The other thing is that uh, with that type of pattern, uh, we are unusually prone to uh, wind events. Uh, that's everything from a garden variety of thunderstorm with a lot of wind to squall lines all the way up to derechos, which can uh, produce strong winds and progress long distances. So operationally, that's your main hazard for the next several weeks. Uh, regarding uh, another item, uh, the uh, resource planning uh, report in the uh, I, I noted, as did uh, David, that uh, you're talking about uh, uh, people mostly responding to uh, economic incentives when it comes to adopting uh, uh, distributed energy, alternative energy. And if you believe that that is the case, and it may well be, uh, I think you need to ask yourself, what statement are you putting out when you say that the more electricity I use for my home, the cheaper my rates get? Thank you. Laverne Train, 49th of Chicago. Um, I really want to commend the nuclear team, decommissioning team. All the reports are awesome. They seem to bring out the negatives along with the positives. They don't seem to gloss anything, and they seem to be really rooted in reality with time scales and those kinds of things. So I really, really thank them for that. Um, and then my response to uh, Mr. Barrett thanking him for asking your management if coal ash was toxic. Response was EPA says it's not. You guys hide a lot behind the EPA. I understand those are the bottom rung rules you have to function on. I'm just going to point out a July 23rd, 2013 article. New report uh, shows OPBD's North Omaha coal plant discharges coal ash waste into Missouri River near his Omaha drinking, drinking intake system. OPBD's outdated water permit at the North Omaha coal plant allows the plant to send water from its bottom ash coal pile runoff pond straight into the Missouri River, not far from the city's water intakes. You might want to ask him about that at the next committee meeting. And then last month, um, the Husker Power people came in. Like, I still don't even know who these people are, but they're, they're nice people. And, um, and they say here that uh, you guys, since we rely heavily on coal to generate electricity, fossil fuels and everything, uh, that we impact the air we breathe, the health of our citizens, our climate. They list all the monoxides and toxides that I've listed here before you many times. You know, and they say mercury is a neurotoxin, and it's horrible, and, and there's 142 lakes and streams in Nebraska that now have fish consumption advisories, primary due to mercury contamination, acid rain from sulfur dioxide, nitric oxides, poison rivers, oceans, and then they get on with their <clears throat> greenhouse gases, too, that you guys are causing. So I know the EPA allows all that, but the citizens of your state don't seem to allow that. <clears throat> because this Husker Power Plan seems to be something that was generated from the citizens of your state. Of course, I've been asking to shut down the North Omaha plant for a lot of years. <clears throat> and this was a 2018, uh, the second thing I read. So clearly the 2013 and 2018, you really haven't fixed the contaminations and problems from that plant. And because the you know, EPA is in disarray and the current administration wants to toss it back to the states, to decide about coal ash and coal burning, it's in your lap. This is the state, this is the office, this is, we're here, it's in your lap. You guys have to decide now if, it, if what I just read to you is appropriate for your state and for your citizens, not the EPA. I hope you listen to your citizens, I hope you read all this data I'm gonna give you, because uh, you know I give you the data. <clears throat> and I hope you, you take the power that they're trying to give you. 
and run with it. I know you're running for the renewables, and that's happy, and I'm really happy for lots of stuff. But I'll be much happier when that, fort, that North Omaha coal plant shuts off and you start running those gas plants like you promised. You have three of them idle 90% right. of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm, before we start, I'm, uh, I'm a bit confused. I was a little bit late. I apologize. This is the general comment section. Is, yes. there, a, is there a comment <laughs> section on, on SD9 t later today? No, just this. OK. Uh, well, I'll talk about SD9. Uh, I know you had the vote on it, but um, I'm the Husker Power Plan guy, one of them. Anyway, guilty as charged. <laughs> Matt Gregory with Nebraska Wildlife Federation. Uh, so about SD9, um, so I have some things here for you to uh, consider that I think would be useful, kind of narrowing. Uh, down the language, maybe speaking more concretely uh, and less open-ended. Um, concerning demand-side management programs, I'd ask that you consider what the power, Husker Power Plan proposes, utility-driven peak demand management programs designed to ramp up over several years, reaching the ability by the fifth year of the plan to deliver 2% annual reduction in electricity and natural gas consumed through energy efficiency measures uh, to deliver 13 to 2% annual reductions uh, in the peak demand. And that's based on assessments by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy and additional peak demand reductions strategies um, such as air conditioner controls, better irrigation scheduling, and interruptible service agreements could supplement those gains to achieve a 2% annual reduction uh, in peak load from current projections. Uh, to properly evaluate the risk of fuel costs, I ask you to keep in mind that the fuel cost of coal and natural gas as well as the cost of transportation, which adds $7.62 to $11.34 per megawatt hour to coal based on the power plant. Uh, and this info can be found in the consultant's report on the Husker power plan, uh, which I provided last time. Nebraska Utilities paid $356 million for the cost of mining and delivering coal uh, to power plants in 2014. Much of that left the state uh, supporting jobs elsewhere, and I think we can do better. The cost of wind has dropped by 66% over the past six years. Prices for utility solar energy power purchase agreements have dropped 75% over the last seven years, and the technologies continue to improve, and the cost of both wind and solar energy is expected to continue to drop. Uh, wanted to say something um, about external costs as well, like health. I mean, these are real costs. Uh, you know, if a child goes to the hospital for respiratory uh, illnesses uh, due to the coal plant in North Omaha, for example, an innocent party has to pay for that. So I believe that external costs uh, should be considered. Um, as I finish up, uh, in uh, bullet point two, to properly evaluate the range of risks posed by varying future assumption, I strongly urge you to consider including climate change in the language, which will impact economic growth for sure and potentially other future assumptions. Uh, and with that, I will let it be. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kavanaugh and the members of the OPD board. Uh, my name is Tony Tachek, and I live at 430 South 159th Street. I'm a student at Creighton University, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to comment on Strategic Directive 9, which is being th revised throughout the summer. Strategic Directive 9 states that OPPD is to ensure that all integrated resource strategic plans support and align with OPPD's strategic directives. The rate restructure of 2015 incentivizes the use of more energy, which is in conflict with Strategic Directive 7 that states that OPPD shall conduct its business in a matter that meets all environmental regulatory standards and enhances natural resource conservation and stewardship. By providing lower rates to those who consume more electricity and higher rates to those consuming less electricity or who are already using renewable alternatives does not enhance natural resource conservation and stewardship. Economic theory indicates that higher fixed charges will provide less motivation for customers to engage in energy efficiency or conservation efforts, leading to increased consumption and higher system costs, which are then passed on to the customer. 
Uh, shifting to a higher fixed cost may also disproportionately place the energy burden on low-income consumers who often use ele less electricity than the average residential customer. To offset the fixed costs of transmitting and producing energy, OPPD should consider using time of use rates, which charge a higher usage rate for power that is produced by inefficient coal or natural gas plants during times of peak demand. Time of use rates are more favorable for customers, and it has been an incentive to promote residential and community solar throughout the country. Time of use rates are also beneficial for utility companies because it alleviates issues related to the recovery costs associated with maintaining transmission facilities and standby generation by aligning charges with the transmission system use. Nebraska is also the seventh highest state in energy consumption per person. Energy economists say that our current energy economy is only 14% efficient. Uh, this means that some 86% of energy used in America is wasted. Much of that energy is also lost to inefficiencies in vehicle engines, light bulbs, motors, appliances, and inefficient buildings. And some of that energy used to transport local transport coal or gas long distances to where it's used, like here in Nebraska. I realize the OPBD has already made steps addressing some of these efficiency issues. However, uh, the Husker Power Plan calls for efficiency measures that would amount to a 2% annual reduction in electricity and natural, con natural gas consumed by the fifth year of the plan. I would like to propose that OPBD inserts specific language that can be found in the Husker Power Plan into their strategic directives to encourage more efficiency and continue to lead the way we power the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other speakers, thank you all for attending and uh, meeting is adjourned.